Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Tanya Day and I am the site manager at the Orange County Historical Museum. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, before I begin, I would like to remind you to please put it on active speaker view. That is going to be the most comfortable view for most people. Um, also, we are recording this session, so please, please turn off your microphones, turn off your, your video cameras, I'll make sure that happens, and uh, that way we can all focus on the presentation for the recording. So again, thank you for joining us here tonight for Moving Into the Back Country, which is part three of a four-part series with Tom Magnuson, the Networks of Early North Carolina History. So a lot of you have already attended part one and two, so you're quite familiar with Tom and his research, but if you haven't, I do have a quick biography that I'd like to uh, help introduce Tom to you. So Tom was born and raised in Minnesota, and he entered the Merchant Marines while still in high school, working summers on river and lake craft. After high school, he became a blue water seaman for a year before trying out college, but it wasn't quite to his liking. So he did enlist with the US Marine Corps. And after four years there, he married and returned to college. Upon returning to college, he earned his BA and MA in American history while employed as a research specialist in the integrated circuit industry. Uh, after that, he was employed by the US Navy Special Projects Office. Uh, the Navy did send him to Naval Postgraduate School, and there he was convinced to continue his research after completing his course of study. In 1978, Tom moved to North Carolina, where he studied and worked with the military historian Theodore Roth at Duke University. It started as just a fleeting interest in North Carolina's cultural, culture and history, but eventually it took over his life, and it led to him creating, in 1999, the Trading Path Association. And he did so in his way to preserve the vestiges of the wonderful history that is oftentimes threatened by urban sprawl. So I will turn on Tom's microphone and video. And we are so honored that we are going to be able to host him today. As I said, this is part three of the four part series and it's been absolutely phenomenal being able to host him for these. Uh, and we're so glad that y'all are enjoying the series as well. Fantastic. Hello, Tom, can you hear me? I can, I can. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And thank you all for, for coming out tonight to, or sitting down tonight to listen to this. Um, it's, it's been a long time in the making and uh, y'all have been uh, very generous uh, with your support. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna start babbling about uh, the evidence that we have of backcountry settlement. But before I do that, I, I wanna uh, explain the prelude to that backcountry settlement. Uh, and Tom, well, would you be able to share your screen with us? I thought I did, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. There it is. And there it is. Fantastic. Right. I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. All right. Um, the first presentation that I, I did in this series uh, was, uh, uh, well, let me back up. I, 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 the whole series resulted from my studying a single map. And it was an, uh, a map that was very overlooked uh, by ma uh, map enthusiasts. Um, 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 the uh, uh, most important map collector in, in the Southeast uh, wrote essays on every one of the maps that showed North Carolina, and he never mentioned the most important features on this map. And uh, they caught my eye one day, and all of a sudden I realized that I, I was looking at an amazing uh, set of facts. And this was the 1733 Mosley map. And what I saw on that map that, that fed into my first presentation was a, a large, a commercially large well on uh, Ocracoke uh, Island. And I said, what was that about? And that led me down a rabbit hole uh, studying pirates and privateers and explorers. It turns out that uh, uh, 
Verrazano, uh, when he was coasting the uh, eastern seaboard, came into Pamlico Sound. Why did he come into Pamlico Sound? Well, I'm convinced that he came in to replenish, to refurbish his, his, his food supply and his water supply. And that was, it turned out, I believe, the evidence that I, I, I produced for that, that show indicates that the Native Americans, the indigenous people, had a commercial relationship with uh, explorers and privateers and pirates because the North Carolina sounds were half the distance uh, for a safe refurbishment. And you either had to go to Jamaica or, or Bermuda to refresh your supplies. North Carolina was half that far. We were sitting right next to the Spanish main, which the Spanish main ran from Florida all the way to Columbia. And that's where all of the real money was. So Carolina was a very important resupply point in the 17th century before the English got interested in North Carolina and, and uh, 16th century even. So that was an important presentation and I, I'm still convinced that it, it, there's a lot of potential for research. Uh, and second presentation was uh, the first permanent settlement in North Carolina. And that was stimulated by a book that came out in 2017, which said that North Carolina did not have a founder's story which I considered to be utter nonsense. Uh, there, there was a, a passel of religious refugees uh, who uh, were Cromwellian soldiers and their families who left England because of uh, 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 the usual uh, labor surplus after war, after the English Civil War. And, and they came to America and weren't aware that Virginia and Maryland uh, hated them. Uh, the Virginia governor was a rabid royalist and Anglican, and the, the Baltimore governor, uh, Governor Baltimore of Maryland, uh, was a, a fanatic Catholic. And so both the Virginia and, and Maryland governors saw these, these uh, Cromwellian refugees as heretics, and they were killing them. And so these people escaped down into the, the uh, dismal swamp and they set up shop on, on the coast of the uh, north coast of the Albemarle Sound. They bought land from Native Americans and they lived in peace with their native neighbors. They, and I am personally convinced that the reason they've been left out of the history books is that they, they disgraced the Anglicans by successfully uh, living in peace with their neighbors. And, and nobody wanted to look too closely at the English assumption that these natives were just uh, a cannon fodder. Uh, the Quakers married them, and that was their biggest mistake. I think the one drop rule uh, did, them, did them wrong uh, because to this day, there is a multiracial community in the Albemarle district that dates back to the 17th century. Uh, now, the third presentation, the one you're going to hear tonight, is about these settlers that lived amongst their uh, uh, Yopam Indian neighbors and, and got overpowered. Anglicans decided they wanted a piece of that trade action down in the sounds. And so they began filtering in uh, to the Albemarle in the 1690s. And by 1700, were able to challenge the Quaker dominance. The Quakers uh, dominated the politics of Carolina, which there was no North and South Carolina at this point, it was just Carolina. And uh, uh, Charleston doesn't come into being until about that point. Uh, and uh, so uh, these uh, Quakers up in the Albemarle, every time the proprietor sent over a governor, they'd fire him, send him back home and put one of their own in office. And they, they governed for the people and refused to want part of their treaty agreement with their natives, native neighbors, was that they would not settle on the west side of the Chowan River, which was uh, in Tuscarora land. So once the Anglicans uh, took over and, and uh, got control of the government in the Altamara, they started settling in, in, on Tuscarora land. And I think most of us know that that resulted in John Lawson being fricasseed by the Tuscarora 
And that was the beginning of the Tuscarora War in, in 1711. Uh, this all, the dates that I have on this program reflect uh, uh, the uh, Carey's Rebellion, which kind of culminated in 1705, the Tuscarora War that ended in 1715, and 1754 is the year that Hillsborough was formed and the Anglicans moved in on the Quakers. And that was kind of the end of their escape. So what we're going to do today is talk about their escape from the Anglicans and then, and then what happens when they, when they get caught up again. So I'm just arranging what evidence I know because most of this, uh, this period, the, the Quakers hid. They were, they were totally obscured intentionally. And that of course is my challenge. <coughs> if, they abs if they absconded into the back country, they didn't want to be found. There's absolutely no documents demonstrating that they left the Albemarle once the Anglicans took control. There are though, these evidences, place names with Quaker in them. Uh, uh, William Powell's uh, Gazetteer, which I'll talk about in a minute, had the only entries in that Gazetteer that re relate to a religion are four Quaker place names, and, and they're on the earliest maps. That's one piece of evidence. And then there was this peculiar relationship with the Pennsylvania Quakers once they started showing up in the 1740s, which <coughs> they, their tenants were different than the Albemarle tenants. And there was genuine hostilities between these two Quaker groups. Uh, the Pennsylvania Quakers were pacifists, so they, there were no fistfights involved but there was a whole lot of, of reading one or another person out of a meeting for being disruptive. Uh, when they decided that they needed to have a meeting to defend themselves from the Pennsylvanians, uh, the Cane Creek Quaker, Quakers sent two women preachers down to the Albemarle uh, to a meeting that they had belonged to, to get permission to open a new meeting, which is basically the way Quakers handle uh, uh, spawning new meetings. And finally, the most important evidence that I have is Okanichi lore, which uh, uh, the Okanichi uh, uh, have uh, demonstrated, I think successfully, that uh, they, they stayed in North Carolina until the 1820s because their Quaker friends sheltered them from the slavers. And when North Carolina outlawed Manumission, the Quakers had to leave, and the Okanichi left with them, went up to Indiana, Indiana and Ohio, and didn't come back until after the Civil War. So that's the evidence is, uh, that I'm dealing with. Here's this, the, kind of the, the literature, uh, which is almost all very accessible. Uh, uh, Babbitt's might be the most difficult to find, uh, but uh, what Larry Babbitt did is he, he's a wonderful military historian. And he went to England and um, uh, he found the, the receipts that British Army officers issued uh, to uh, North Carolina citizens when they confiscated property. And uh, uh, he had his graduate students over the years do genealogy on these receipts. And 60% and of the names that appear on these receipts for property that was valuable enough to be confiscated don't exist in any other record. They weren't in the militia. They weren't on, on any road crews. They weren't on any juries. They were not property owners. And this means that uh, Larry Babbitt's proved that all of the uh, assumptions of, about uh, demographics in, in North Carolina in the colonial period are wrong and because they're all based on, on existing records, uh, uh, on, on court records and court records only reflect property ownership. So the second one here, uh, the papers of William Berkeley, he's the main most jerk up in, in Virginia and uh, he, he was a prolific writer and he was always whining about the dissenters that were irritating him here, there and everywhere. Uh, the third one is, is Bill Cummings, the Southeastern Early Maps. It's a, a very expensive book, but you can find it in most libraries. And he collected all of the maps that showed uh, North Carolina from the earliest uh, map up to, up to the 20th century. 
and then put them all in this book and, and wrote essays about each one. Uh, the, uh, we're going to talk about the Thigpens eventually tonight. Uh, the, the Thigpen family were Quakers in the, in the Albemarle that became uh, biracial and, and they now consider themselves to be a, a separate tribe. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful little self-published genealogy about the Thigpen tribe. And the first book written about the, the first settlement in North Carolina is, is The Hidden Americans uh, by Hugo Prosper Lemming. And his family was part of this group of, of multiracial people. He was a preacher and he, his church, his parish was right off the University of Chicago campus. And uh, he went back and got a PhD when he was uh, quite old. And uh, before he could edit that PhD uh, dissertation, he died. But the dissertation footnotes are an absolute treasure trove that has been pillaged by everyone writing about this moment in history. And not a single one has given him credit in their, in their, in their notes. But if you want to read about the, the uh, uh, Maroons of, of Virginia and Carolina up in the Albemarle, read the 1995 edition. There's a 1967 edition, which is the unedited one, which is utterly unreadable. But the, uh, the 1995 from Rutledge is a wonderful book. Edward Mosley's map is what got me started on all this stuff. You can find it online and, and uh, download it if you want to play with it. It's a wonderfully amusing map. Uh, uh, Bill Powell's Gazetteer, if you don't know about it, you should. Uh, if, if you don't own a copy, you should. Uh, there are two editions of, of Bill, uh, Bill's Gazetteer. Uh, and uh, the first one is, is bound in yellow. They're all paperback. I don't think there's a, uh, there might be a library copy. But uh, the second edition uh, it was done after a 1970s committee, committee that, uh, that North Carolina established to get the naughty names out of the, out of the, the uh, 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 geography of North Carolina so that uh, uh, Cold Ass Creek became Cold Bottom Creek. And if you have the two together, you can find out what offended people in 1978. Um, the mother of meetings, Cane Creek, uh, is, is just a very, very important to, to, as part of our story, but being Quakers, they're excruciatingly modest, and, and you have to really read between the lines on uh, Bobby Teague's book to understand that these people were here long before they started a meeting. And finally, Cotters and Squatters is, is one of these obscure little books that uh, anybody uh, studying uh, land tenure in the, in the 18th and 17th century should have on their shelf because it, it is about English land tenure laws, which informed the imagination of the settlers in Carolina. And when you trying to understand why people came up and created farms with barns and houses and fences and crops and didn't own the land, if you read this book, you'll understand why. They, they assume that they were establishing a right to be on the land, but that right never crossed the, the Atlantic. Uh, there's uh, the five categories of evidence that I'm going to use tonight. Uh, the, the, the Quaker place names. Uh, there's the Albemarle Quakers that uh, had that first permanent settlement. Uh, I think they escaped into the back country when, they, uh, when the Anglicans took over. Uh, the Cane Creek meeting obviously derived from an Albemarle meeting. They sent two, two lady preachers down there to get permission to open the Cane Creek meeting in 1751. Uh, and something that nobody's ever noticed before and is the most important thing on that Mosley map is there is a wagon road. In seven, on a 1733 map, there's a wagon road that ha, there's no account for it in any public record. Nobody, nobody requested that road. The only reason I found out about it is, is uh, uh, I'm easily amused. And I was reading uh, 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 highway marker signs in Georgia and found out about it. There's a single highway marker sign about Thigpen's trail. And so I began researching the Thigpen angle 
And it turned out that in 1702, he got a contract uh, to build a military road from the Chesapeake to the Gulf of Mexico. And he did it by 1704. And uh, the other evidence that we have is that, uh, by the way, there's a, a Magnuson's axiom of roads. If a road exists and it's not blocked, people are going to use it. Uh, and by, by the mid 18th century, you look at the land grants in Orange County and whole farms are being granted. Very well developed farms. This, the, the people have been there for generations were having their farm sold out from under them because in the back country, there was no species, there was no coinage and the government required cash payment for grants. And so people came in from Pennsylvania and just bought these places out from under the early settlers. And that eventually leads to the, the war of the regulation. Uh, the undercount of the, of the back country, I talked about already, uh, Babbitt's uh, found that, that that there were plenty of people back here that weren't being counted and didn't, didn't appear in the records. Uh, the most important category of evidence is the Okanichi lore. Uh, during the Tuscarora War, a mercenary army came up into North Carolina and the payment for participation in the Tuscarora War was all the slaves you could capture. So every time uh, the warriors uh, the European and, and Native American warriors gathered enough slaves to be rich, uh, they'd, they'd take a break. <laughs> they'd go back to South Carolina and sell their slaves. So it, it took several years uh, to end the Tuscarora War because the army kept breaking up. And uh, after the war, the Siouan people in the Piedmont became a target for the slavers. And uh, it, as early as 1701, John Lawson had noticed that uh, fewer than six Native American people remained in the back country. One in six, one in six uh, remained in the back country. And they simply had a, a, no ability to defend themselves. And they became uh, dependent on the, on the Quaker neighbors, according to their lore, to protect them from the slavers. So that's the strongest evidence that the uh, uh, Quakers were in the back country by 1715 or so. Uh, the reason Cane Creek probably dates from the Tuscarora War is that uh, the Anglicans forced themselves into this trade with the uh, pi pirates and privateers and disempowered the Quakers uh, by test, test laws. You had, to, you had to swear allegiance to the uh, king and to the Anglican church in order to hold public office after the Anglicans got control of the government. And as a result, the Quakers uh, lost power, lost political power, lost economic power, and uh, more importantly, had to pay tithes to Anglican churches they hated and, and uh, tug their forelocks when they were talking to Anglicans. So I think that was the motive for moving into the back country. There's at least one party that moved into the back country by rowing up the Noose River and that Quaker Neck near modern Goldsboro uh, was was uh, probably settled in 1715 or 16. And then there were four other parties that uh, migrated along Thigman's Trace and uh, uh, established themselves uh, approximate to Thigman's Trace, but not on it. They did not want to be seen. So they're at least a half day to a day off the beaten track so that travelers won't report them. Uh, and generally speaking, when you are relocating in colonial America, you really need to get permission from your local court to leave. And these people, there's no record that they ask for permission. And they, as a result, they were wanted people. And that, again, was a motive for not being seen. It makes it very difficult for the historian to locate them. But we had two Quaker sects by the, by the middle of the 18th century. We had two Quaker sects in, in North Carolina. And uh, going back to my first, uh, second presentation, when, when the Albemarle settlers uh, um, established their relationship with their neighbors, uh, the rumor about it, word about it leaked out. And uh, George Fox, the founder of the Friends of Society, 
uh, was traveling in Pennsylvania and he heard about these people and he came down to Albemarle and he lived with them for, for some days and preached to them for some days and nights. And in his journals, he said, these are very godly people and they're doing it the right way. Uh, that is, they're, they're living at peace with their neighbors. And uh, he immediately went back to London in, in an attempt, I think, to get control of, of the schisms that were uh, the difference between the Quakers and the Albemarle, uh, who, after he left, a, a high percentage of those people in the Albemarle thought of themselves as Quakers. And all of a sudden, Quaker meetings pop up all over the Albemarle. So the 1733 Mosley map shows at least a half a dozen or eight Quaker meetings in the album of 1733. Uh, so I'm saying that these, these folks were uh, hiding from Eng English law, Anglican law, and sheltering with their indigenous neighbors and protecting them from slavers. Uh, a wonderfully high calling. And pressure grew from the Pennsylvania Quakers. Uh, Cane Creek finally had to let everyone know where they were and they sent two lady preachers down to the women's meeting and uh, asked permission to start a meeting. This is the, the basic mechanism for spawning meetings was to get permission from the meeting you had left to open a new monthly meeting. And uh, the they, uh, Pennsylvania Quakers, uh, as soon as the meeting was established, started joining it. And then there was nothing but friction. Uh, and there is this felt need to have their own Quaker establishment. And they, they, when they say mother of meetings, they did. They, they spawned meetings all over North and South Carolina. And the evidence for that to this day is that, in, uh, that North Carolina has the highest incidence of women uh, meeting leaders of any state in the country. And, and so uh, that, that to me is all the evidence I needed. I, I'm easy. Uh, here's the disputes between the Albemarle and the London and Philadelphia Quakers. And the main one is that women were not only encouraged, they were accepted altogether in Albemarle as being meeting leaders, just like the Native Americans. The Native American clan mothers were the uh, essentially the senior personnel in any village. They're the ones that approved uh, uh, chiefs. They're the ones that labeled shaman. You, know, you couldn't be a shaman without permission from the clan mothers. So they're very much like the indigenous folks. They're married in with them, which means that the one drop rule makes them not acceptable until now. And that's one of the things that, that I think poisoned uh, the, the opinion of historians was that they uh, miscegenated and religious uh, their practices, according to Hugo Prosper Lemming, they weren't 1% deviation or different from their Native American neighbors. They brought musical instruments to meeting. They never dressed door. Uh, they got up and danced. They shook. They quaked. And uh, they, they, because they were living defensively in the album, rock, they never became pacifists. They always believed in self-defense. And they just avoided contact with non-Quakers, whereas the Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, uh, London Quakers uh, got into this, you know, uh, very uh, subdued uh, dress code. Uh, they did participate in government. They would not let women lead their meetings and they disdained uh, indigenous folk as, as inferiors. And, and they, they adopted pacifism and allowed everybody else to keep them safe. Um, Thigpen's Trail is so important uh, that it really needs a study of its own. And I, I hope some young person grabs a hold of that story and, and digs out the evidence in, in England. They're going to have to go to the, the uh, imperial records and the colonial records in England to find out about James Thigpen's uh, contract and, and the road he built. Queen Anne's War uh, broke out in 1702. It was the second or third world war in, in the uh, Anglo, French and Spanish wars uh, that, all, that appeared all over the world. These were the first world wars. And Queen Anne's war was uh, a, 
subset of the uh, war of the Spanish succession. And uh, Spain's uh, uh, Native American allies had been harassing uh, settlers in the south of Carolina uh, all the way up to Charleston. So as soon as they learned that there was a war on, uh, the Carolinians mustered their militia and got, began training them and gave a contract to a militiaman and, and, and uh, to build that road from the Chesapeake to the Gulf of Mexico. And he completed by 1704, 1704 and 1705, uh, the former governor, James Moore, led the combined militias of Virginia, North Carolina and South Carolina, or, uh, no, there was no South Carolina yet, Virginia and Carolina down to uh, Mobile Bay where they spanked the French and then they went over to St. Augustine and, and kind of slapped the, the Spanish around. Uh, 1705, they had literally wiped out the Appalachian uh, indigenous folk who had the misfortune of, of partnering with the Spanish. Uh, by 1705, Thigpen's Trace is an avenue to land that John Lawson said was the flower of Carolina, the Hall Fields, the, the land between the Eno River and the Hall River, which Lawson thought was the sweetest land that he saw when he walked from, uh, well, when he, he walked basically from, from uh, Charleston, or rather uh, Charlotte, to, to uh, uh, New Bern. And he, he thought that, that land that, that this road went right through was the, the best. And so when there's a road to get to it and there's something valuable to get to, people are going to do it. Uh, this I throw this slide in because it talks about these two ladies uh, uh, and, and Abigail Pike and, and, and Rachel Wright were the two uh, ministers that went down to Perquimans County and, and requested a quarterly meeting permission to establish a monthly meeting at Payne Creek. And uh, Abigail Pike is, is on the record in most of the Quaker meetings uh, uh, from the head of, of, of Thigpen's Trace on, 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 on the Chesapeake all the way down to South Carolina. I don't know how far she traveled down but she was a traveling minister and she kind of tied them all together and was a, I, I imagine she, she kept everybody posted on, on change to tenants and so forth. Uh, I haven't studied here. I've looked at Rachel Wright a little bit more. Herman husband, who was a Pennsylvania Quaker jerk, um, accused uh, uh, Rachel Wright's daughter of fornication and had the daughter read out a meeting and Rachel Wright left with her. She ended up at a meeting in South Carolina. Uh, like I said, it is a possibility that the incoming Pennsylvania Quakers uh, encouraged the uh, uh, Albemarle Quakers. And of course, the creation of Orange County meant that the Albemarle Quaker settlement at Cane Creek was now under Anglican government once again. So they, they started creating defenses and because they weren't about to move. And uh, that Pike, Ms. Pike was, was at the Hopewell meeting, which is right at the mouth of, of the uh, uh, river that flows through Petersburg. And, and uh, uh, that association with the Hope, Hope, Hopewell meeting uh, at the Thigpen Trace and, and all of the other meetings along uh, Thigpen's Trail uh, leads me to believe that this was the route that, that Quakers preferred. Uh, I explained earlier that that's, that's the method for spawning new meetings. Uh, but they stayed concealed until they absolutely had to come out of hiding. And uh, let, me, let me show you some evidence here. This, this is the Albemarle on a 1733 map. It's the, uh, around 1700, English map makers uh, had just about fully adopted a convention where they, uh, when they drew a wagon road, they used parallel lines, the same track that the wagon made on, a, on the ground. Uh, horse trails used dash lines and, and human porter trails uh, used docks. 
and, and so these are wagon roads in the album in 1733. It's a pretty dense matrix. And interestingly, uh, to the west of the Dismal Swamp, there's uh, uh, the, the roads that appear on this map are still in existence. And the terrain just absolutely dictates it. There's uh, something called the Suffolk Escarpment, which is a, an old seashore uh, where you can get uh, about 10 feet above of flood uh, and stay on it all the way from Suffolk down to to uh, Edenton. Uh, so that's that's a demonstration that there were these wagon roads in the Albemarle. And this is the this is the map that's got me all hot and bothered. Uh, that that this is Thiepman's Trace right here in 1733. There's only one other map outside the uh, road outside the Albemarle. And that's this road, which goes down to Charleston and connects the south end of Carolina with the north end of Carolina. Eventually, you have a governor in Charleston and a lieutenant governor in Edenton. And that's, I think, 1705 or so, we become North and South Carolina. But at this time, 1733, this is North Carolina. And this road is a wagon road. And the reason I know it's a wagon road is I zoom in on it. And this is uh, at the Haw River. Uh, it's got that double parallel lines. It looked like a singular line. And most people took it to be a trail because it was labeled a trading road. Everybody thought it was a pack horse trail. And it wasn't, it was a wagon road. Uh, the Quaker place names that are very interesting because in, in Paul's Gazetteer, the only place names associated with religion were Quaker. And there is no such thing as, as Methodist Gap or Baptist uh, Lake or Baptist River, but you've got Quaker Neck, Quaker Creek, Quaker Gap, and Quaker Meadow. And uh, those are, are all on the earliest maps. Uh, when when the counties were formed, those, those place names were already there. All of them are approximate to, but not on Thigpen's Trace, except for Quaker Neck, which was uh, probably settled, like I said earlier, by, by boat up from yeah, along the Noose River. They, uh, uh, they used Thigpen's Trace, but they didn't want to be seen. So they, they're, they're one, uh, a half to a day's uh, walk off of the beaten path. And uh, Becky Dobbs' uh, dissertation, which I mentioned in the bibliography, uh, Rebecca Dobbs did her dissertation at UNC and she used early land grants in Orange County uh, as, and, and she mapped them with GIS. And in Orange County, uh, Pennsylvania land grants line both sides of Thigpen's Trace. And uh, at, at one point, uh, everything, every piece of land to the uh, southeast and north of, of uh, Hillsborough was owned by Quakers. And they uh, eventually, I think I'll probably talk about it in a minute, they, uh, these were Pennsylvania Quakers. And they, I think because of the discomfort of being near these whack uh, Albemarle Quakers uh, who like women preachers, they left. 350 families of, of Pennsylvania Quakers sold their land and moved down to Georgia in, uh, uh, bef before uh, the Battle of the Alamance. So here's Thigpen's Trace and the concentration of Quakers. Uh, Quaker Neck, like I said, was probably settled on, by rowing up the river. And Cane Creek, this is very general. This is not triangular. I just wanted to uh, show that it was a big spot below these hills and uh, the, we don't know how broad the settlement was uh, to, but I'm, I'm thinking that it was uh, uh, settled by, by 1715 to 20 somewhere in there and Quaker Creek is over in Alamance County and it's about a half day's walk off of Thigpen's Trace. Quaker Gap, I've mislocated this, this should be more down in here. And it's one day off of, of Thigpen's Trace. And of course, Quaker Meadow 
is about a half day off of, of, of Sigmund's trace. And th that's, I think, pretty powerful proof that they were here early and were important, important enough to be to become landmarks. Okay, the most, I think the most powerful evidence is the Okanichi. Uh, they, when they left North Carolina and went with their Quaker friends up to Indiana and Ohio, uh, they lost the right to be recognized by North Carolina. And they returned after the Civil War when it was safe, they thought. And uh, North Carolina didn't recognize them until uh, the 19, uh, early 2000s, I think. Uh, and it took a lot of effort on the part of the Okanichi band to demonstrate that they were a coherent uh, band uh, from the beginning to, to the present. And they did oral histories with all of their elders. They collected all the documents they could to prove that they had been here uh, with their Quaker friends until the, uh, what happened was the North Carolina General Assembly, the legislature that we all kind of were embarrassed by, uh, passed a law against manumission. The Quakers uh, were required to mitigate uh, the peculiar institution if they wanted to pay taxes in a slave state. So the mitigation effort in, in North Carolina was each meeting tied a certain number of slaves. And they went out and bought them and taught them and then manumitted them, released them into society. Is very much like Habitat for Humanity, where they, you, you make sure the people are survivable out there, and then you, you give them a chance. You, you teach them a trade. You teach them how to, how to survive in the economy. Anyway, uh, uh, in, in, the 19, in the 1820s, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly outlawed manumission. And uh, <laughs> so much for white supremacy. Uh, the Okanichi uh, then had, uh, since the Tuscarora had, war had been sheltering with their Quaker friends, and they left uh, to, for, for, for obvious reasons. They were going to be slaved again because they weren't white. So are there any questions out there? That's all the evidence I got. That's all the passion I have for the moment. Uh, but I'll, I'll answer any questions you might have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tom. I am always in awe not just of how much you know, but how much you have dug into these topics, which honestly helped me look at history with a different light. I almost feel like um, what you've done is you've read the same map, the same documents that people have for decades and decades, but you're able to see it in a different framework that is really uncovering all sorts of interesting stuff. It helps to be a little bit weird. And Tom is absolutely right. We do have some time for questions, so feel free to pop them into the chat box. But also, Tom, may we share your um, your email address with people in the chat box as well? Feel, feel free. Go right ahead. Fantastic. So we'll put Tom Magnuson's uh, email address into the chat box. So feel free to reach out to him if you come up with anything in the next couple days that you would like to talk to him about or perhaps if you've seen any particular photographs or maps that you think you might more in, need, uh, might know a little bit more about. And while we're waiting on some questions, oh, we do have one question. Have you written all of this up? Have, do you have a published document or unpublished document that you're working on that compiles all of this information? Uh, yes, no, and, and, and I will. Uh, I, I, I have some uh, written uh, uh, documents and uh, somebody suggested uh, just yesterday that a series of, of articles for uh, um, um, the North Carolina magazine, what is that uh, monthly magazine, uh, might, might be a good venue for this stuff. And I've got a, a five uh, separate articles that I would, would publish if I found an outlet to publish them in. And, and uh, I, I'm just beginning to think about it. So something will happen. I've got a, a, a book outline, which is more than I can handle at my age. And it, it was uh, uh, titled uh, tentatively Finding Ways uh, because that's what I did for so many years was find ways to get from point A to point B. 
in, in the Carolina Piedmont mainly. Well, speaking of getting from point A to point B, we do have a question. Uh, you talked about this a little bit, but if you could elaborate, are there any current roads or road systems that follow Thick Pen's Trace? Yes. Uh, Highway 85 is never more than, I think, five miles away from Thick Pen's Trace and, until it gets to Georgia, then there's a, then they deviate. But uh, I have mapped remnants of Thick Pen's Trace all the way from uh, uh, the Petersburg area to Georgia. And there's probably 10% of the original wagon road is still visible. And some of it is downright awe-inspiring because uh, uh, roads uh, were prescribed in the uh, uh, King's Law of the Highway of 1555. Uh, and the road description was, it would be 10 feet wide at the running surface uh, the 25 feet from the center line on both sides of the road would be cleared and there would be a grade no more than 5% anywhere on the road. And that's what I find everywhere. The only time that that road is, is more than 10 feet wide is when it approaches a, a, a Ford. And when you approach the Fords, it, they'll get out to 40, 50, 60 feet wide because the river bottoms are so soft and people get stuck and you have ways to get around it. Uh, but uh, otherwise, these roads, uh, thank goodness for, for the Piedmont clay, <laughs> they, they hold their shape marvelously well. And uh, like I say, there's a lot of remnant out there. Uh, up on Lake Gaston, I found a pack horse road coming up out of the lake, which uh, would have been a guide. Uh, I think Thigpen must have been a pack horseman. That's why he got the contract. He knew the he knew the matrix in the back country. So I suspect that he he was given a contract because he already knew where everything was. And he he did it in two years because he didn't he didn't invent anything. Uh, he just used existing uh, footpaths and horse trails to to widen them and make them suitable for wagons. Uh, the the Deviate, main deviation from, from the original line of the, uh, which I've mapped uh, footpaths and Na Native American uh, moccasin paths in, in the, uh, the Caraway Mountains. And uh, the, the original route went through the Caraways and crossed just uh, at, the, at the forks of, of the Uari rivers. And that uh, uh, original trace uh, uh, was too difficult for wagons. The caraways were virtually impassable for wagons, especially loaded wagons. And so I think that Thigpen uh, uh, went around the south side of the caraways along the line of Highway 64. It's actually the original road that 64 is based on is, is to the north of the current 64. And you can find all kinds of 18th century remnants along that. Uh, one of my favorites is, is, is uh, uh, oh, what's Hal Pugh's pottery? Um, New Salem. Yeah, New Salem pottery. His, 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 the current okay. potter, his ancestors owned this, this clay deposit down there in, in outside of Randleman. And he's still throwing pots using their clay. And, <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And they, the way they got their product to market was a commercial wagon is coming by. They say, you got a hole in your cargo? Yeah. And well, they'd give them a consignment. They'd haul it up to Virginia and sell it. And then drop the money off on his way by in the next trip. So it was, it was a very interesting process for getting your product to market. And like you said, um, Thick Pen would have had to already have been knowledgeable about all of these ways around and, and the ways through. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been so easy and quick for him to be able to officially get that grant, so so to speak, to yeah. meet those. Yeah, I mean, imagine how many years it takes the Department of Transportation to build a two-lane road today. And, and he did it in two years. Uh, and uh, one, I, I'm trying, um, oh gosh, there's a term, and, and, uh, you guys might know it, uh, a, a term for uh, um, architecture 
that uh, is just everybody knew how to do it. If you had a hammer and a saw, vernacular, vernacular architecture. Oh. And I've been, I've, I've been uh, nagging the engineering school at Duke to recognize vernacular engineering because everybody knew how to build these roads. They knew exactly where, where to go with them. And uh, you didn't have to have a, a crew of educated people. You had a crew of experienced people. And, and actually, some... we do have another question um, that is sort of aligned with this. Um, they say that's an incredible feat to be able to build Chesapeake Bay, Chesapeake Bay, Chesapeake Bay, Chesapeake Bay, all the way to, to Mobile in only two years. And yeah, yeah. so this is part of it. Everybody sort of had a good idea of what they needed to do already. Something uh, that uh, yeah, I, I know intuitively and, and have demonstrated repeatedly is, is uh, the physics of movement in the era of muscle power. Hmm. which goes up to the 1830s. And, and uh, until then, overland transportation was all done with muscle power. And there's a book called Alexander and the Logistics of the Macedonian Army, <laughs> which some truly geeky guy uh, <laughs> figured out what every, every one of Alexander's uh, pack animals needed how much water it needed, how much water it needed, how far it could go in a day. And it turns out that every muscle powered carriage from the human up to the elephant moves at two and a half miles an hour when it's carrying cargo. And so that's how far the towns were. They were one day's march apart, which is about 15 miles into Piedmont, 10 to 15 miles. And, and that's, if you take an old uh, North Carolina highway, like 49 or, or 61, and you set a divider at 15 miles and you pick an old town and you stab your divider in it and start walking it down the road, every time the point hits the paper, it lands on a town. Because <laughs> that, that's, that's where people spent the night. And when folks regularly stop someplace, somebody's going to open a soda pop stand. And pretty soon you got a hamlet, you know. Uh, and I found 13 abandoned hamlets in Carolina that uh, got bypassed uh, when, when bridges got built. People no longer use forts. And uh, so uh, the, the impact of, of infrastructural change uh, is absolutely astonishing everywhere. Anyway, I, I'm off topic. Is there any, any, any other questions? Yeah, we've had three fantastic questions that relate to some of the peoples that you talked about uh, during your presentation. And one of them is about the Maroons. Uh, this person would like to know, are the Maroons and the Mulligans the, the same people? Was that just a different term for the same group? I have, uh, I think I've found 13 different terms for oh, wow. multiracial people in the Southeast. Uh, the brass ankles, issues, uh, uh, Melungeons, uh, and the, the Lemming called them Maroons because they were uh, similar to the Maroons of the uh, Spanish Maine, uh, uh, African Native American isolates that uh, survived uh, uh, in small clusters here and there. And Maroons not a bad term for them, they, but you can call them a lot of things. But the main thing is, they're multiracial. And uh, uh, what, our, what anthropologists call uh, triracial isolates, which is a pretty nifty term. It kind of takes all of the bite out of it. Uh, but, but in fact, the Melungeons have been fighting uh, for their recognition uh, for uh, 40, 50 years. And they have successfully uh, fought the Census Bureau to, uh, to victory. They won over the Census Bureau where they can name whatever whatever races they they are, so you, you now can answer more than one race on a census form, and which is a, a, a major step forward. Absolutely, that's only in the last twenty years. And uh, there was a question. You spent some time talking about the difference between the Quakers that were settling around Thinkman's Trace in this area, North Carolina, and the Pennsylvania Quakers, and this person wants to know what about 
what about their differences were influenced by where they were living and how they were living? Uh, the Pennsylvania Quakers were in a little bit more of an urban area where this was sort of a wild backlands country. And perhaps did the, the wildness and the flexibility of where they were living it sort of uh, influence? I think that, that that's, <clears throat> that's a misreading of Pennsylvania history. I mean, Pennsylvania was a wilderness when, when Penn decided to settle it. And there's a, a couple of wonderful books uh, about the walking treaty where uh, the Quakers really shafted the Native Americans in Pennsylvania. And they, they typical of Englishmen, they looked down their nose on anyone that was not an Englishman. And, and uh, that, that was one of the uh, abiding differences between the Albemarle and the Pennsylvania Quakers, was the Albemarle Quakers had a profound respect for the indigenous people and uh, a perfect understanding. Like I said, Lemming uh, suggested that there wasn't one degree of separation between their religious practices. So uh, I, that's a big difference between the Albemarle and the Pens Pennsylvania folks. The Albemarle folks actually could be called, I think, the first Americans. Really? They were no longer Englishmen. They had rejected being Englishmen and they had become Americans and demonstrated that by uh, marrying with their neighbors. And actually the last question I'd like to get to does have to do uh, more with that indigenous history and the incredibly vital role that it's played in some of this research, which I think is quite fascinating and very powerful that these more informal um, remembrances and, and oral histories are just as important and can be really, really helpful. Uh, this person would like to know, is there any way to access some of these oral histories? Um, have they been collected by perhaps Forrest Hazel or Lawrence Dunmore? I know that Lawrence Dunmore is the tribal historian. Yeah, well, uh, Lawrence, uh actually uh, reconstructed the, uh, their language using, using records from Canada. The, the last uh, 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 Siouan uh, language speaker was recorded by an anthropologist in Canada. And uh, they used that uh, uh, history, that record to reconstruct the Okanichi language. Oh, wow. And uh, the documentation for all of this had to be produced uh, for the North Carolina uh, uh, Indian Commission to recognize the Okanichi. And it took them decades to get recognized, but they, they got their ducks in, in line and all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. And all those records reside in the Okanichi tribal office. And that's where I saw them. So they're so undoubtedly still there. And, and Larry Dunmore and, and Forest Hazel and folks like that uh, uh, still have a living memory of the process of producing it. Well, fantastic. So um, people, if they were interested in digging into this, could actually reach out to the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation um, and be able to use some of their, their records. They, they seem to be proud to share what they have. Fantastic. And by the way, we do have an email that we've put into the chat box. Um, programs at orangehistorync.org. Um, and we do still have a few contacts with the tribe as well um, that we would be happy to pass along your way. And so Tom, I will be wrapping it up for us now. Thank you so much again, um, Tom Magnuson for this fantastic presentation. And thank you to everybody that came out here tonight. Again, this is the third in a four part series. You'll be receiving a link to this recording within the next 48 hours or so. And please stay tuned for part four, our wrap up of the series. Information for that will be coming out pretty soon within the next couple of weeks or so. Um, so again, thank you. My name is Tanya Day from the Orange County Historical Museum. If you'd like to come visit us, we are open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays from 11 to four. We have a brand new special exhibit up called Date Night. It was a lot of fun to put together all about dating in the 20th century in Orange County.
Uh, if you'd like to support us so that we can, can continue to bring you these programs for free, uh, please go to our website. You can find a way to donate on our website and we would absolutely welcome any support that we can have from y'all so we can continue to have such fantastic presenters such as Tom. Uh, so thank you again. We hope to see you for part four. We hope to see you in person at the museum. Have a fantastic rest of your evening. Uh, and thank you again, Tom. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks for all the folks that showed up tonight. Uh, we'll try to make that fourth one somehow interesting. <laughs> it's always interesting, Tom. At least I think so. I think these people think so, too. Good night, y'all. Good night. Did you see the other